here on a Wednesday night, excuse me, live in Grace Church, and we get to share the word today. And we're on the radio right now, live out there as it goes out. And, uh, you know, I just thinking through, and uh, might as well give a disclaimer for the sermon right now. I went to the library anticipating to preach about 32 verses. And then God narrowed it down to five. (laughs) And then added about 55 other verses. Oh, I'm not joking. So I hope you feel like a Bible student tonight. And it's not like I'm trying to make a point or trying to prove a point. I'm coming to understand at 62 years of age how important, if I would say how vital, is the church of Jesus Christ. Now, I've always believed in the church, the body, the bride of Christ. That's always been true. But I mean vital. And the sermon tonight really brings that out. And so... Um, not that I think I've minimized the church. I mean, we, you know, you guys know. I'm just telling you in my own DNA, spiritually, I'm starting to understand it's not optional. This is the path that God Almighty has chosen to communicate the gospel so that people can end up in the kingdom. Amen. That's not like extra. And so when I went to the library, I thought we'd just kind of jump over five verses. And God said, no, you're going to land smack dab in them, and then you're going to make this point. And all of that to say, well, what are you trying to say? Well, you guys know I always write on my hand. Tonight's the first time ever, first time ever. When I write on my hand, I write the name Jesus. Because if I miss Jesus in the deal, then we missed it. Amen? Amen. By the way, we've been singing to him, and I love that last song, okay? So you got it. And then I always write the Holy Spirit. Right after Jesus, I always write the Holy Spirit. Is that, is that true? You guys know. I mean, I told you enough, right? If you're a guest tonight, you're saying you write on your hand. Yeah, that way I don't mess up and forget that it takes Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And then right after the Holy Spirit, I always write the word gospel. If we don't get to the gospel, the good news about Christ and why he died, that's why I always put a cross on my hand. And somebody said, you write these sermons out? Yeah, I write them out. And then I tell myself to be nice. Somebody heard that in Florida. Brian in uh, Florida heard that. And then he sent me a picture. He wrote be nice on his uh, thumb so that when he's driving his car, because he just heard that I write it on my hand. Well, he wrote it there so he could see it. And I thought, that's pretty cool. But I said, okay, be nice. But it's the first time ever with Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the gospel that tonight, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. You can check it. Check my hand on Sunday. I wrote the word church. The church. And and I'm telling you, it's the deal of God. That's why Christ died. That's why the Holy Spirit empowers. That's why the gospel goes out. He has chosen the church. Nobody said amen. I'm not talking about a building. I'm not talking about a denomination. I'm talking about the people of God that come together in community to get through another Wednesday so that we can represent the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and the gospel. He has chosen the church. It'd be like if uh, you're in the wrong business, the wrong job, the wrong family, the wrong city, the wrong country, the wrong politics, Everything's wrong, 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 and you know it. And people keep trying to make it work. We'll just make this, we'll just make it work. And it doesn't work. And you don't know what else to do, and you're so frustrated. I mean, it's the only job, it's the only tradition, it's the only city, it's the only thing you've ever had, the only, I mean, it's the only thing you've ever known. And so with a holy frustration, you try to do the best you can and just to survive life. Welcome to 99.9% of everybody out there. And by the way, welcome to Judaism when Jesus showed up. 
Rome occupies. They haven't been in control since Babylon. They're going through the motions, tradition, tradition. Oh, they've got their Bible, but they never read it. They've got their traditions. They got their, you know, synagogues. They got their temple. They have the old covenant. And just to remind you, Jesus did not come to patch up the old covenant. He came to introduce the new covenant. He's not throwing Judaism away. He's completing it with all new. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And we've been walking through the God. I guess I'm already preaching. I didn't know I'd go right into this. But okay, he came unto his own. His own received him not. So he said, okay then we're going to do it new. We're just going to do it new. And then all these people out there frustrated in their jobs, their economy, their culture, their country, trying to find some meaning to life. And I don't care if you're talking about Galilee or U.S. of A. He says, we're going to do a new deal. And we're going to get it started. And I want you to be a part of it. Oh, not Pastor Bill. Jesus Christ. I want you to be a part of it. A part of what? A whole new nation. Do you have a slide for a whole new nation? Can I get that right now? There you go. Way to go, Patricia. A new nation. And I want you to be a member. I want you to be a citizen. I want you. Matter of fact, I choose you to be a part of it. Well, where's that going to end up? <laughs> it is the beginning and the cultivation of the kingdom. So in case you had a hard Wednesday, if you're having a boring life, if your doctor's just going like, well, we don't know for sure. And your banker says, well, we do know for sure. You're, <laughs> and nobody loves you or pays attention to you. And you're thinking, and, uh, well, we'll just kind of go to church and you know, hope for the best. Hope for the best. You're in the best deal going. Because we don't stay in Amarillo forever. We are headed for the kingdom with the king and left us here to do a job. Okay? Okay, now let me back all that up. If you're good Bible students, I'm just going through the gospel of Luke. I've never... Never noticed this this way before. Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5 on page 1186. Page 1186, he's coming down through, he's doing miracles, he's preaching, he's multiplying food, he's doing all that. The scribes and the Pharisees, I, I want to call them scabs and parasites, but the scribes and the Pharisees are dogging him, they're watching, they're not buying it for a while they were. But I mean, it's just getting worse and worse. And, and finally, he's got a parable. Chapter 536, we saw this two weeks ago. The parable is key to watch the, the information of, of Dr. Luke. You've got to follow the text in the context. So chapter 5, going backwards to verse 36. You guys there, page 1186? If you're not looking at the Bible, man, I feel for you because that means you have to trust me. Stand up for the Word of God in respect to the Word of God. This is not sermon. This is the Word of God. Then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece of new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear, and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. Or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled. And the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. And both are preserved. And no one, having drunk old wine immediately, desires new. For he says, the old is better. We've talked about that parable. We'll see how that parable looks as we walk through the Gospel of Luke. But Jesus talking to the scribes, the Pharisees, to Judaism, talking to people just caught in religion. You need new wine. 
A new covenant. Problem is, you don't just patch it up. No, it's got to be new. But if you try to put new wine in an old wineskin, the wineskin can't handle the fermentation, cannot handle. It's going to blow up in a good way. You're going to get bigger and increase. Your capacity for God's going to grow. But new wine has to go into new wineskins. You can't just teach an old dog new tricks. Well, Pastor Bill, what do you want? I want my heart to stay new. Not just to receive the new covenant, but to stay new, to get more new wine. There's more here that God wants me to understand so that I can get through my sorry life as well. You don't have a sorry life. Well, I do unless I stay stay focused on Jesus and what he's called me to in this this whole thing called the church and how it's really new. You say, it's been around my whole life. No, it's really new. And we're just getting started. I better pray, huh? You're saying, he's really fired up. Yeah, I am. Do I have to be fired up? No, but I am praying that you will have the gift of listening tonight to many Bible verses. You know, some, some preachers preach sermons like skyscrapers. It's story on story on story on story on story. They quote a verse and they just tell you stories the rest of the time. This one's going to be a skyscraper of Bible verses. It's going to be Bible verse upon Bible verse upon Bible verse. What do we need to know? You have been chosen by God for the kingdom. You have been chosen by God for the church. There's no higher honor. We just have a tendency to forget about it. Father, thank you for your word. Help me as I walk through the Gospel of Luke. As we pinpoint this, and then, Lord, that I could personally receive encouragement that you, you picked me, you've handpicked me to be a part of this. And the others around me here tonight, you've handpicked us, Lord, before anything was. You chose us to be a part of this thing, this new nation, this body, this bride, this ecclesia, the church of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God. We're not going to throw Israel away, Lord, but we we don't want to minimize the church. So I just thank you. Help us to catch that tonight from Scripture. And that, Lord, when we go back to whatever job, whatever doctor, whatever marriage, whatever neighborhood, that we're here, but we represent you. And all these things are temporary. Even this body I'm in is temporary, Lord, for the reality of the new that is to come. So teach us about the new tonight, I pray. And that, Lord, we be humble that you want us to be a part of it, not as spectators, but as participants. So help us, Lord. Holy Spirit, I give you freedom to, to work in my heart, my head, my spirit, and all of my friends here. Jesus, that you would come, you would be lifted up, that we would see this is your bride, this is your body, and you deserve all the glory. You do, Lord for the great work you've done at the cross and are still doing now from heaven's side. Even so, come Lord Jesus would be my prayer. You're the only ones worthy. In the name of Christ, God's people would say, hey, greet somebody quick around you. Welcome them to Grace Church. Okay, everybody, keep your Bibles open. Let me show you how chapter 5 flows into chapter 6. How chapter 5 flows into chapter 6. Remember that when Dr. Luke was putting this together with the eyewitnesses and all the things that uh, he was formulating... He has a purpose. He didn't write chapter 5 and then start writing chapter 6. That's so that we can turn and, and be on the same page. He was writing one book. 
Paragraph flowed into paragraph. Story flowed into story. He's telling us what happened with Jesus and how he's getting dogged by all the scribes and Pharisees. And so Jesus drops a parable on the scribes and Pharisees that are watching everything he does. They're wondering, well, is he healing on the Sabbath? What's going on now? Now he's calling Matthew, the, the Levi, or uh, the tax collector, Levi, the tax collector, who's also Matthew, and now they're having a party, and how come nobody's fasting? It's Jesus knows what's going on. He's already read their brains. So he throws down the parable. I, I can't put new wine in you because you're an old wineskin. And it's all about new wine now, about the new covenant. I'm not here to put a a piece of new cloth on an old garment. It doesn't work. we got to do things new. Well, what are you going to do new? How about a new Sabbath? You're all caught up in Sabbath and which day to worship and make sure nobody messes up on Sabbath. How about a new Sabbath? That's why with Dr. Luke, chapter 6 goes right into new. And so you got two stories about the Sabbath. Man, they really get upset on this because Sabbath is their deal. Well, Jesus shares with them to remind you of last week, if you missed last week. By the time you get to verse 5, there they are. They're dogging them on Sabbath. And he he said to them, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. You're, You're ticked off my disciples are like eating some grain on Saturday? Let me tell you, the Son of Man, that's a messianic title. That's from the book of Daniel. The Son of Man is Lord. When he uses that word Lord right there, I'm Almighty God. I am Lord, Almighty God of Sabbath. You guys keep trying to figure, I'm not yelling at you, I'm, I'm Jesus, what's going through his brain back then, okay? You're going like, I don't know, we'll come on Sunday or Saturday, I don't care what day you come, just understand it's a new Sabbath, and Jesus is Sabbath. You understand that, right? He's my Sabbath rest. He finished the work. What do I got to do? Nothing. Nothing. I get to rest in him. Some people say, well, it's a special day. Knock yourself out. That's okay, according to the book. Some people think every day. I'm an everyday guy. That's absolutely fine. Just understand the new Sabbath is Christ. There are people running around, doing this, dressing that way, eating this, not eating that, thinking that somehow that's the old. I came to make all things new. Don't you love Jesus? Man, they really got mad. They really got mad. When he said, I am Lord, the Son of Man is Lord of this, they really got mad. So they set him up. They found a guy with a withered hand, stuck him right in the middle of synagogue on a Saturday. See if he'll heal that guy. Jesus read their thoughts. Don't you love Jesus? You know, I mean, if Jesus came to us for counseling and said, hey, what do you think I should? Well, don't take him off. Lighten up a little bit. Maybe wait to heal until the next day. I love our Savior. He he already knows. So let's let's get it on. He read their thoughts and said, the whole thing's a setup. What? That I can't, are you testing to see if I can heal on the Sabbath? Is that the deal to whether to do good or bad and to do good? So you want me to heal this guy? You don't think I should heal the guy? Hey, stand up. The guy stood up. Stretch out your hand. By the way, when Jesus asked the guy with the withered hand, he can't do that because his hand's withered. He's asking him to do something he can't do. Alas, you're almighty God, and the whole Sabbath is already changing because he is Lord of the Sabbath. He gets healed on the spot. By the way, did Jesus work? Jesus didn't do anything, just spoke to him. By the way, that's not illegal to do on Sabbath. But he poked him right in the eye. I love our Savior. He knows that. Now, don't go poking people in the eye. (laughs) Unless you got chapter and verse and they deserve it. Sometimes once in a while. Oh, Pastor Bill, you don't do that. I'm doing it to some of you right now. I can see what you're thinking. What is this? Yeah. So, finally, at the end of that story, I mean, he's doing all this. He's healing on the Sabbath and The disciples are harvesting grain on the Sabbath, and he's preaching on the Sabbath, and they come to their final. And do not miss Luke coming from the parable. All things are new here with the new wine. Uh, He comes to verse 11 where we left off last week. 
After healing the guy, stretch out your hand. He did so. His hand was restored as whole as the other, verse 11. But they were filled with rage. Can I hear you say rage? rage. The story's getting worse. It went from bad to really bad. They were filled with rage, disgust with one another, what they might do to Jesus. You, you now are at a critical mass. You are at the turning point. The religious leaders of Israel are rejecting him. They represent the nation officially. The rabbis, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees are rejecting him. What are we going to do with him? And the more he performs as Messiah, the more they hate him. Let's kill him. Let's just kill him. It's time for Jesus to do something new. New wine into new wineskins. Old nation is rejecting me. New Sabbath, I am Sabbath. A new nation. We're going to start a new nation. Well, you can't do that. I can do anything I want. I came unto my own, and they said no. Okay? I'm going to start a new nation. I didn't hear one amen. I didn't hear one praise God. Maybe he's just trying to patch up the old. He's not going to patch up the old. He's going to take all those disciples that have been following him. By the way, there were hundreds of disciples. And from those disciples, he's going to pick. He's going to handpick 12 of them. Why are you picking 12? Because I'm going to replace the 12 tribes of Israel. That's going on hold, and I'm starting a whole new deal. You say, where'd you get that? Next paragraph. You guys are still out there thinking too much. It's like, hey, what are you doing? I'm telling you, the church is a big deal. And it started practically on earth right here. He's been rejected. I need some apostles. Let's get it on. Chapter 6. By the way, I'm having a great day. You guys, okay, now hold on. We're going to cover a lot of verses. I haven't even got to the five that we're going to cover. Here's the five. So uh, they were filled with rage, discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Now it came to pass. We got a whole new Sabbath. We get now a whole new nation. Now it came to pass in those days, while they're rejecting, everybody's upside down, that he went out to the mountain to pray. Isn't it great that Jesus would go out to a solitary place and pray, and at times he'd go out to the mountain, he'd pray. Can I hear an amen? Amen. You just have to get away. And you might say, well, he doesn't have to pray. He's God. He's also man. He fought his battles and struggles the same way we fight ours. He didn't play that divinity card Until he had to. We saw that with the temptation and the devil for 40 days. And now you see, he's at the crossroads. I'm rejected. It's time to look at all these disciples and figure out which 12 I need. He could have used his sovereign intellect. But instead, I'm going to pray all night. He went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Jesus, why are you praying all night? Because each one I handpick is vital to jumpstart a new nation, the church. My time is running out. There are 300 million in the world. At that point in time, there was 300 million people in the world. And I got to pick the right guys so that when I leave, 
they can get the job done. Now stop for a second. If you're just a fisherman, or you're just a tax collector, or you're just a zealot, I mean, you're just out there and you follow Jesus, and you're following, there's no way in the world you'd ever imagine that he might pick me to do like the biggest thing that could ever be a big thing since the resurrection. Do I hear an amen? It's like, I don't think we fully understand what a big deal is that Jesus picked you. I'm ahead of myself. i got to get back here. Okay, you with me? Okay, hang on, hang on. Here's a lot of ground. Hang, well, i got to stop here for the five verses. It came to pass in those days he went up to the mountain to pray. Continued all night in prayer. Why? This is really big. And when it was day, he called his disciples. There was hundreds of them. He called his disciples. By the way, to be a disciple. It's his disciples. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I hope you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. You say, well, I got saved. There's a difference between getting saved and being a disciple. That's why we say making disciples. Not disciples of Grace Church. Not disciples of Pastor Bill. Disciples of Jesus Christ. That means you follow him. Oh, I forgot. You're the Wednesday night group. Thank you. Pastor Bill, what do you want? I'm just so excited for you and me. Let me see. Continue all night. When it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them... He chose, can I hear you say the word chose? He chose 12. Well, why didn't you choose 200? Because he didn't. Why weren't there 200 tribes? Because there wasn't, there just wasn't. There's 12. Now there's 12 apostles. This is not old Judaism patched up. This is all new Nation, body, bride, church, kingdom. Israel's going to go on hold for a while, and now it's Jews and Gentiles together with the apostles being the foundation of that. You tracking with me? You say, where do we come in? Hold on, hold on, hold on. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve whom he also named apostles. Can I hear you say apostles? Apostles Apostles are different than disciples. I hope we're all disciples of Jesus. Apostles are ambassadors. Apostles are sent ones. And there's like the apostles. Today there might be a apostle, but the apostles are like, like the 12 tribes of Israel. There are 12 men that are apostles, okay? They end up in the new kingdom, in the new Jerusalem. They're like the gates around the city. Are you tracking with me? Okay, there's 12 of them. Look at who he called. Somebody needs to counsel Jesus again. He chose 12. These are going to be like the 12 key guys of the whole new nation, whom he also named apostles. Simon, who is also called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. Andrew's actually the guy that got Peter. Don't know a lot about Andrew, but we do know a lot about Peter. Man, that guy was always under control, a great spokesman, really, really, especially you put him in a suit. That guy looked just, hey, Jesus, you might, you might need to pray some more because Peter has a way of getting ahead of himself, saying stuff he should never say. Yeah, but you watch what I do with him. After this nation gets started, the Holy Spirit baptizes him. You watch. He tried to preach before in Acts chapter 1, but you watch how he preaches after the Holy Spirit falls. Unbelievable. Yeah, I know he messed up over and over again while I was here, but you watch when he writes First and Second Peter. That man will change the world. Not just his world, he'll change your world. If you read First and Second Peter, it's still changing the world. When God calls you to be a part of the church, it ain't like so you can have a happy little life. It'll change the world. Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James and John. Whoa, whoa, don't call the sons of thunder. They're always fighting, then they get their mom in there all the time. Which one's going to be the greatest? Jesus was so patient. Really? Yeah, John was the most beloved. James is the first one to die. 
John ends up writing five books of your New Testament. Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the Revelation. Yeah, but they're just fishermen, brothers in business together. Uh, watch what happens when I call disciples and start a new nation. Excuse me, I lost my place here a second. Um, Philip, don't, we don't know much about Philip. Bartholomew, that's also Nathaniel, same guy. Don't know much about him. Why don't we know much? Because we don't. Matthew, hey, that's Levi. That We do know about Matthew and Levi. He was kind of pro-Rome, tax collector for Rome. And Thomas, don't know a lot about Thomas. James, the son of Alphaeus. And Simon called the Zealot. We do know about Simon the Zealot. He's actually so radically hostile to, he's a radical fanatic against Rome. And you've got Levi, who was a tax collector for Rome. Hey, Jesus, you're going to have a problem at your board meetings. By the way, Jesus doesn't have board meetings. He's the leader. You guys follow. Just do what I told you to do. It's like I look around this room. It's amazing. You guys are all in the same room, same church. You're so different. You're all weird like me because we are weird. What's the point? He calls the foolish and the helpless, the weak, the base. He calls people that are just nobodies because the only buddy that gets credit for that is him. Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. Hey, Jesus, do you know what you're doing? I know exactly what I'm doing. By the way, Judas was not a bad guy. At the beginning, he became a traitor. Just think about Judas a little. We'll go back to him in a little bit. Say, well, what's the deal? Well, I actually was just going to quote those verses and say, okay, he prayed, picked his disciples, and they go on. And I was going to bust through. Maybe we'll get to that next week. But I, I stopped and I thought, what, why did he pray all night? Why did he pick those guys? What's going on? Uh, new wine into new wineskins. You rejected me. Brand new Sabbath. All oh, it's me. Brand new nation. It's them. I got one guy saying that's right. And the rest of you are looking like, we don't know, Pastor Bill. Should we amen that? You better amen that because you're a part of it. Now let me prove it. Can I prove it? How about the words of Jesus? Look at Matthew 21. Matthew 21, page 1138 of a black Bible. Matthew 21 and verse 42. This is where the marathon of verses is about to begin. What's the point? It's a new nation chosen by God. And you can be a part of it. Matthew 21, verse 42, Jesus said to them, Have you never read... Have you never read the scripture? By the way, they didn't read their scriptures. They didn't know their Bibles. I hope you do. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation. Can I hear you say nation? That's a new nation. It's going to be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken. But on, whom, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. Duh, he was. But when they sought to lay their hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. That's on page 1391. 1 Peter chapter 2, page 1391. This is the Peter that was chosen to be part of this new nation. This is after Peter and the church is all established. Now we have the same Peter writing to us, First and Second Peter. Notice what he says in chapter 2, and I'll start in verse 9. I could go back. It's a repeat of what Jesus just said in Matthew, but... Uh, 
Peter now says in chapter 2, verse 9, are you guys there? Okay. Jesus said, or the Lord would say through Peter, but you are a chosen generation. That's kind of the key word I'm looking at, chosen. Can I hear you say chosen? Well, who choose, chose what? Well, Jesus prayed all night to choose the right 12 out of all the hundreds. From those 12, Judas was replaced, the Holy Spirit fell, and the church gets started. And from that, the Gentiles are brought in. And from that, years later, he's writing 1 Peter. Are you tracking with me? But watch what he says. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Can I hear you say royalty? Some of you don't look like you're royalty. You don't look like you're chosen. But my Bible tells me you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Can I hear you say holy nation? Where'd that come from? When Jesus prayed all night and started everything new. Some like the old. Some would say, well, the old's good enough for me. Hear me. I want the new. I want the new covenant in his blood. And then I want the relationship that goes beyond a religion to where like, you know, I'm the bride of Christ and he's the husband. I'm the body. He's the head. And he's picked us to be there. A chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people. Well, he must be talking about somebody else because I'm just a guy that used to bag groceries in Commerce City, Colorado. He, he wouldn't meet. There's nothing special about me. And there's not until he calls you to be a part of this new nation, this new kingdom, this church. Matter of fact, because you weren't special might be the reason he called you so that now you can be special. Did, did you watch that a little bit? Because you weren't special might be the reason he called you so that now you can be special. Of the 12, seven were fishermen. Back in that time, almost anybody could be a fisherman. After a shepherd, anybody could pretty much be a fisherman. There's only one guy who was a tax collector. Uh, his own special being, that you may proclaim, why, why, why? That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now you are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. Why did he call me? So that you can proclaim, you can testify, we can go to the park and say, hey, not because we just amen when I tell you to amen, but that we can actually, actually represent the Lord at your job, in your city, on the radio, all those things combined. We were left here to show everybody what great and marvelous grace the Lord has done in what he's done, taking me, taking you, taking the church out of the darkness and into the marvelous light. Are you tracking with me? Well, wait, 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 wait. What, what about that Judas guy? What, what, what about that Judas guy? He was called. He was chosen. He went out and did miracles. What about him? I'm glad you asked. Go to John 6, 6, 6. You went, ooh, like that's a bad number. That is a bad number. But it just shows up that in John chapter 6, verse 66, that's 1229 of a black Bible. Hey, Jesus, did you know what you were doing when you called Judas? Yes, I did. Did Judas receive the call? Yes, he did. Who's responsible? There's a big argument going on in John chapter 6 because Jesus just dropped on him that he is the bread of heaven. You must eat of my body and drink of my blood. They thought you were talking about cannibalism. He's not talking about cannibalism. He's saying you have to really, really believe me and trust me and consume me. Verse 63, the words I speak to you are spirit and they are life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said 
And he said, therefore, I've said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back. They left him. They walked away. And they walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the 12. We already know the 12. We just read that. Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, we, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you? I handpicked you. I prayed all night. I chose you, the twelve. And one of you is the devil. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. For it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. Hey, Pastor Bill, we got some questions on this one. Well, I'm glad you got some questions. Can I tell you dogmatically the point? Is that okay? Don't be Judas. Mary got really quiet in the room right there. You know what everybody's theological brain's doing? Like, what did he just say? Make sure you're not Judas. Somebody went to a theologian and asked him this question. Why did Jesus choose Judas to be his disciple? The teacher replied, I don't know. Come on, Pastor Bill, tell us why Jesus chose Judas. I don't know. But I have an even harder question. Why did Jesus choose me? We can sit around and have theological debates about Judas. His time is gone. He did his deed and he was replaced. I can tell you, make sure you're not a Judas. And why did he choose us? Why did he choose me? I'm still baffled by this in the sense, you know, when I got saved, when I got saved, I mean, the number one, the number one person in my life, I mean, immediately, God put this, this other girl in my life, about a year older than me, her name is Sue, and I mean, she became like the fire of God in my life, and her and another guy named Chris, and they... they Accountability. I was just a 16 year old kid and reading the Bible and getting excited and starting to witness and going on mission trips. All of that happened because of Sue and Chris and that, that energy. And they discipled me in Christ. Are you tracking with me? And then I go off to Bible college and things start to happen. And she marries our youth pastor. And you just, and then before you know it, 40 years go by. Isn't it amazing when you get old how that can happen? Like, woohoo! And so I was, in, I was in Denver about four years ago. And I was going down that, that memory lane thing. I don't know if you do this sometimes, but you drive out to the trailer park where the trailer you used to live in, you know, used to be. And you drive by your old grocery store where you used to work. And you just go down memory lane. And when you go and do that, it conjures up thoughts. And so I had done that. But I got thinking about Sue. And I hadn't talked to her in 30 Nine years. And I got talking, thinking about Phil Meany. He's the guy on the motorcycle that when I wrecked, he saw it. And I thought, I got, I got to try to find these guys. Maybe I'm just, you know, 
over midlife crisis. But anyways, I, I just said, I, I got to find him. Now, Phil, Phil never came to know the Lord that I know of. And so I knew that. So when I called him, we met at a IHOP and had coffee and talked. And, and I got to tell him what all God's done in my life since I flipped the motorcycle. He, he remembered that. And I asked him, I said, Phil, can, can I, is it any chance you'd let me send you Bible verses? Well, I'd love that. I've been sending Phil Meany Bible verses now for four years. And when he goes through a big, he hits me back. Or the Denver Broncos are winning, then he hits me on that. But anyway, he's still my buddy, and he's still Phil, and I'm still hoping, I, I don't know his heart, but I'm hoping he comes to know the Lord and has that fire, and here we go. We're like, yeah. I got to find Sue. I got to find Sue. I got I to got, I find Sue. So I tried to find Sue. I couldn't find Sue. I got on Facebook. Okay, I can't find Sue. I go, How can't you find anything on Facebook, right? And then, you know, I started checking around, started checking around, and finally I had to piece together a couple of things from my youth pastor to this and that. And finally, 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 I thought, that's their number, their phone number. So <laughs> I called it. And an answer machine picked up. Roger, Sue, this is Bill Gem from Commerce City, Colorado, in 1972, Motorcycle Colorado. We went to think, and I went to Bible College, and I'm in ah! <laughs> Not quite that bad, but I'm sure it sounded that bad when they listened to it. I just, I just want to talk to you. A week went by, another week went by, another week went by. And finally, I was at the library, and my phone went off, and I looked at it. And I thought, it's Sue, the one that discipled me, the one that was in love with you, that we read the Bible again. And I answered the phone. And she said, Bill, I said, Sue. She said, like, well, what do you need? So I told her, and she said, well, that's nice. I said, well, I'm at the library right now, like, studying. She said, Bill, here's where her words, I'll never forget. Here were her words. She said, we were just kids. You don't read your Bible all the time? You're not excited about Jesus all the time? And you know that thing that happens inside your, like, Sue. I'm so sorry. She was polite. I was polite. But when I, when I hung up, it felt just like, See, I don't know how to answer that theological dilemma, but I can say this. Don't you be Judas. I was at a restaurant Friday night and ran into a, a sister that she should be here. She should be here tonight. But her and her husband is split. She's sitting in the restaurant with somebody I don't know, and you have that awkward... I could use the word busted. So I didn't whip out my Bible and start sending lightning bolts her way. No. Hey, how you doing? And then she and they got the dude sitting there. He's just a dude. You know, he's a dude. He doesn't care I'm there. He doesn't know who I am. And then she doesn't know, like, ah, ah, oh, how you doing? Better than you are, but no, I. <laughs> It was just, it was one of those things. And then, then she, you know, and then the guy's looking up from his phone, like, you know, and like, and she said, well, this is, uh, this is Bill. <laughs> she had to go back and correct herself. This is Pastor Bill. That same balloon inside of me. What happened? And there are seasons. I understand seasons. There are times. But I, I, could, I could go on and on and on. You were front and center. You were main line. You were part of leadership. You were here. You say, what's that look like? One out of 12. One out of 12. I don't care if you're talking about board, pastors, 
ushers, greeters, people that used to sit in the room. Now, I if they go to another church, I get that. If they love Jesus, I get that. Whoa, way to go. It's when all of a sudden it's like, mm-mm, I'm done. Well, Pastor Bill, where do you put that? I don't know where to put that except don't be Judas. Well, we're here on Wednesday night. Way to go. <laughs> See, it's not that I have to figure out why Jesus chose Judas. I have to remind myself why Jesus chose me and why Jesus chose you. So be encouraged. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Boy, do I have to go, 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 go through these scriptures. Ephesians chapter 1, page 1342, page 1342. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, you guys there? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose, can I hear you say chose? God the Father, just as he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Can you believe it? I've been handpicked by God the Father. A gift given to Jesus Christ, and so have you. You say, what is that? That's election. That's being chosen. That's predestination. And you say, well, I don't know if I believe that. Well, you'd have to rip out the page of Ephesians from your Bible. Don't do that. God is sovereign. Well, I thought I had free will. You do. Just read on. Verse 12, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also have, after you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you also, having believed. Can I hear you say having believed? Oh, by the way, it's not a religion. It's a relationship. You were picked and you believed. He picked you and you said yes. You tracking with me? They're both in the same chapter. Having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory? Amen, amen. So like, just to remind you real quick, it's, like, it's a relationship. Like, I spotted Cindy. I chose Cindy. I set the whole thing up. I predestinated her. You're going to be my wife. But I didn't tell her like that. I chased her all around, set the whole thing up, and then I asked her. And she has free will. I could answer for her, but no, she can say yes or no. So that when she said yes, I didn't say, well, I knew you'd say yes. No, when she said yes, yes, she said yes. Why? I set the whole thing up, but she said yes. Can I tell you the whole thing was set up on you? But when you said yes, Jesus Christ said yes. And the angels in heaven danced. You say which side? They're both sides are true, okay? That's a lot of theology real quick. Chapter 1. <laughs> uh, Look at chapter 2. Why, why though? Why? Why were we chosen to be a part of this thing? Why? Why? If I just said, well, chapter 2, verse 8, you know. Uh, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Could I hear an amen for that? It's all by grace. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. By the way, you weren't saved just to sit around. You were saved to represent. Amen. You said what? Your good works. Amen. Why? We're headed for the kingdom. You're already citizens. The church is the biggest deal going, guys. It's still new. Right. Right. We're not to the end yet. We're not to the end. Boy, when we get to the end, it's going to be a glorious wedding in heaven, and he brings his kingdom. I can't wait. Verse 19 of chapter 2. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens and saints with the saints and members of the household of God. It's a whole new nation. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Well, I thought I was just coming to church. You are the church. Amen. This holy temple, this building, the foundation of Christ, the apostles and prophets, you're part of it. You're a living stone. Can I hear an amen? amen. See, you're, you're more important than you thought. 
Yeah, but what do I do? Well, you do your part. Chapter 4, verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors. Praise God, I, I love my job. I love, I love being a pastor. And teachers, for the equipping of the saints. You're already saints. I got one amen. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry. What's the work of ministry? What's your job you're supposed to do? Just like those apostles had jobs. They represent it. You all have been given a gift. You have a job. For the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to the perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him, who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together, by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part, every part, every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. What you do matters. numerically and spiritually. What do you want us to do? What Jesus Christ has called you to do. The main thing is just love each other. We would just love people. Just love them. Don't get irritated with them. I know you want to get irritated, but don't get irritated. Just love them. Speak the truth in love. Tell them to be okay. Picnic's free. Just come to the park. Come to the park. Come on. Put your arm around them. Tell them it'll be okay. Jesus loves them. That's why in chapter 5, walk in love as Christ also loved us and given himself for us. Just walk in love. Chapter 5, verse 8. Walk as children of the light. We just walk as children of the light. Verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. It's just this walk we have with the Lord. Don't be drunk with wine, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, wives submit, husbands love, children obey your parents, bond servants be obedient, masters be careful with your servants. Verse 10, be strong in the Lord, put on the full armor, stand firm, let's go to heaven. So it's really practical. What do you want us to do? Be filled with the Spirit, new wine. Don't be an old wineskin. Under the power of the new wine. Be the wife, the husband, the parent, the child, the employer, the employee, the soldier, full armor on. Because he picked us Amen. to represent him. Amen. Amen. Amen? I almost made it, but I'll stop there. If you want more, you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He has chosen the foolish. He has chosen the weak. He has chosen the base things to confound the wise. Who did that? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it's a whole new nation with a whole new Sabbath and a whole new wineskin. The best is still yet to come. Amen. Don't be Judas. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you that you actually use the church to create jealousy in the nation of Israel that will bring her back as well. Another sermon. But that's true from the book of Romans. I would never pretend that somehow we replace Israel. She's on hold. But nor would I want to minimize the body and bride of Jesus Christ and what you've called us to be a part of, Lord. Locally in this little building, at this intersection in the city, 
but universally, historically, and especially with the future coming, Lord. You've chosen us, just like you did Peter or Matthew. You chose us. You've equipped us, you've sealed us, you've blessed us, you've gifted us so that we can represent in love and love and love our Savior. Help us to love people when 40 years can go by and I pray for my friend Sue. I pray for the sister from Friday. I pray for people that come in and out of this building. And somehow, Lord, that you'd be extra gracious and there'd be a jealousy and they would come back to their first love. Help us, Lord, that we won't be Judas. How I thank you for this church, my friends, the privilege it is to pastor them. Pray that we'd always be new wine with new wineskins, that Holy Spirit, you'd be pleased to expand our hearts to know more of you. That we might be filled with the Holy Spirit. That I might be the husband you've called me to be. My sisters here could be the wives you've called us to be. Our families, Lord. The best way to love our community is with our families. And then on the job, whether we're the boss or the employee, how we act as citizens, Lord. The way we put on the full armor as we represent you. Bless us, Lord. Thank you that you picked us. You handpicked us. May we stay in love with you, Lord. Come quickly. Bless our picnic this Sunday if you should tarry. I pray that people might be saved. That Jesus might receive all the honor and glory because he's the only one that's worthy. And all God's people would say. I love you guys.